go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast from the shores of Lake Tahoe. You know, it's been well documented that equities had a fantastic 2023, albeit driven primarily by mega cap tech stocks and the Magnificent Seven. You know, today we're going to talk about some other parts of the markets, uh, particularly real assets. And I have the perfect guest on who is a Top Gun award-winning portfolio manager to discuss the real asset asset class and how the dynamic macro environment impacts them and what is in store for the asset class in 2024 in the head. But first, today's episode is sponsored by the award-winning Zephyr, which helps advisors, wealth managers, financial analysts, and investment professionals make more informed investment decisions. So with that, moving on to the star of the show, enough from me. Uh, I would like to welcome David Grumhaus. David is the president and chief investment officer of Duff and Phelps Investment Company, investment management company. He is responsible for setting and executing the firm's strategic initiatives, overseeing the investment strategies, and leading the executive committee. In addition, Mr. Grumhaus is a senior portfolio manager on the firm's energy infrastructure strategies. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really an honor and privilege to have you on. You know, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself along with Duff and Phelps Investment Management Company? Sure, Ryan. It's great to, great to be here today. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be on the show. Um, so, you know, I guess I'll start with Duff and Phelps. Duff and Phelps was uh, founded 90 years ago uh, with the goal of providing research uh, on utilities to institutional investors. Um, and that's still very much part of our DNA today. Um, today, we are a specialized uh, investment manager focused on real assets. And when we talk about real assets, we're talking about things like uh, real estate REITs, um, utilities, infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure, um, and we have about $12 billion under assets under management. Uh, the two core products there are our REITs and global REITs um, okay. and then global listed infrastructure. Um, and then we also have some smaller growing strategies um, in water, uh, clean energy, uh, and midstream energy. Um, in terms of a little background on myself, I've been at Duff and Phelps 10 years, um, born and raised in Chicago, um, spent uh, 10 or 11 years in investment banking and then moved over. Um, to the investment management side about uh, 20 plus years ago. And I've been at Duff and Phelps the last 10 years. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I guess I didn't realize Duff and Phelps was around for 90 years. So yeah. it just gives you the breadth of experience within the firm it has in this space. And I'm glad you brought up real assets because sometimes I feel as if real assets, some people just think, oh, it's gold and precious metals and things that you can like touch, right? Um, but there is other like infrastructure, you said, and I'm really later on in this conversation, we'll talk about water. So I'm really interested to hear there. So I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought that up. You know, the macro backdrop has been a very popular talking point over the past couple of years, and rightfully so, right. um, because the uncertain monetary policies, we've had four decade high inflation. You know, what are your thoughts on the macro backdrop, you know, there's a lot there to uncover there. We could talk a whole, whole episode just on, you know, the macro backdrop, but what's your thoughts on uh, the sure. macro environment? I, you know, it, as you say, it's been a really fascinating time in the market. Um, you know, very rarely do you have people lined up on so many different sides. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been a tough time for the strategists. I would say, you know, especially over the last 18 months, most of the strategists have had a hard time getting it right. Um, you know, and I and I look. I don't blame them. I I will admit that we were a little bit more cautious last year, um, and even a little bit more cautious coming into this year. Um, you know, you had a lot of reasons to think that a recession was right around the corner, right? I mean, yeah. you know, the typical um, the, the typical historical evidence of recessions, right? You know, a very inv inverted yield curve, right, for eighteen plus months now in inversion. Um, you know, very weak uh, negative leading economic indicators, right. Uh, PMI is uh, well below 50, right? A lot of reasons to think that every time in the past when you'd had those things that a recession was on its way, 
Um, but, um, you know, the market's proved to be really, really resilient. And I think, um, you know, coming into this year, um, you know, everyone uh, uh, was excited about the Fed, right? You know, people had uh, Fed cuts coming in March and thinking that we were um, going to have six Fed cuts in, in this year. And when that sort of started sinking in, you know, in the early in the fourth quarter last year, uh, that's really what turned the market and led to that, you know, massive fourth quarter rally that we saw. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is we've seen a real shift in that, right? You know, no longer it's going to be six cuts. I think most people are thinking it's two or three cuts, right? Um, you know, March seems very unlikely. I think people are now thinking more like June or July. Um, yet, despite that shift and despite the importance interest rates always carry, right, the, the market the market has proved incredibly resilient. And so, um, you know, I think what's what's changed a little bit, certainly changed in my mind, is that, you know, it was all about can the Fed orchestrate this soft landing and we're going to get the interest rate cuts and that's going to drive the soft landing. Um, you know, I think where where people where the market is now is, you know, maybe the soft landing has already occurred. Or maybe there's just going to be no landing, right? And we're just going to keep moving forward through this. Um, and that certainly, to me, seems like you know probably more where we're at. Where we're at. Um, mm -hmm. Look, this can turn on a dime. I mean, I've been reading for for 12 months from the strategists about how you know you can have a big GDP quarter one quarter, and then the recession hits, and you just sort of fall off the cliff. And so, I think as investors, we got to be very wary of that. And, you know, the February to April time period, the comps do get a little bit tougher from the, on the economic point of view. Um, but, you know, things look pretty resilient right now. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to be betting against, you know, that all of a sudden things are going to fall apart. The other thing I'd say, I think we do know the Fed wants to cut, right? They don't want to keep these elevated levels. Um, I think they understand that there's this sort of maturity wall that's coming both on the federal government level with the deficit and the, and the Treasury needing to roll over. Um, a, a lot of uh, bonds, um, but also at the company level that, you know, as, as debt rolls off here, companies are going to have to refinance at much yeah. higher levels. So they're anxious to get the, the rates down. So, you know, I think we see any tiny bit of weakness, um, the Fed will jump in and, and move on that. David, that was fantastic. So much there to uncover. You covered a lot. Uh, thank you. One thing I keep going back to, you talk about strategists. It, it is a very difficult time for the past couple of years, three years, really. I mean, when's the last time it's we've come from a pandemic, right? Um, decades and decades ago, right? Um, it just hasn't happened. So it's hard to go back in time and, and you know, use it as a benchmark. And it's such an unprecedented time. And, you know, when it was 40 years ago that the Fed ratcheted rates this high and it's such a different market environment. So it does make it very difficult for the past couple of years. And yeah, I agree with you. It just the economy has been very resilient. Markets have been re really resilient. I'm glad I'm not a perma bear or trying to short, short the markets right now because it would be very difficult than something... I, I won't want to do. And, and then you have a consumer, right? It, the consumer continues just to be resilient to, I think, like, like you said, resilience is the name of the game right now, I think. Right. I mean, it's, you know, Ryan, it's always, you never want to say it's going to be different this time because we know that it always comes back to haunt you. But, um, you know, I'm increasingly thinking maybe it is going to be different this time for exactly the reasons you saw, right? We're coming out of a global pandemic. We really haven't had one of those. Maybe a hundred years ago, we had one of those, but you know, in, in sort of modern um, economic times, we really haven't had something like mm -hmm. this, at least across the globe. And, um, you know, that created a lot of situations, um, you know, whether it was supply chains, whether it was, you know, participation in the job market, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it was, you know, just the massive amount of stimulus that we saw, especially uh, from, the, from the U.S. government, right? Um, it's a very different scenario. So maybe because of all that, it is going to be different this time, or it's going to play out differently. And, um, you know, as investors, I think it's most important um, to be nimble, right? I think is, um, you know, I try and set a, a, a strategy with my team and try and have an outlook. Um, but when I'm sort of constantly reminding them and constantly reminding myself and echoing to them is, um, yeah, we can have an outlook, but we're not going to, you know, fall on our sword on that outlook, right? If the facts change or the evidence changes, you've got to be willing to to make a switch. And and mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I think that that's been true here as we've watched the market and watched the economy over the last four or five months. That's a very good point. 
very good point. It, it's kind of like a lot of objectives and strategies and philosophies have probably changed over the years. Um, you talked about interest rates and yields, and we've got to talk about it, right? Uh, what impact do interest rates and the Fed have on real assets? Yeah, so so this has not been a, a, a good environment for real assets. Um, you know, typically what we'll see with real assets is, you know, why people like real assets is because they are real assets and they hold value, right? And they tend to, um, uh, at least in a lot of the sectors, have contracts um, with escalators that are based on inflation. So, you know, when real assets have, have traditionally worked really well as in times of higher inflation, right? And we certainly saw a nice performance um, uh, in the real asset space in, in 2022, for the most part, mm -hmm. um, when, when inflation was starting to run rampant. So, um, but, you know, right now we're in a situation where people really aren't worried about inflation anymore, right? Everyone thinks it's coming down. It is coming down. Um, and so I think you've, you've seen people move away from real assets. Okay. Um, you know, I think you're in this situation where um, you have a combination of higher rates um, for longer than I think we thought there were going to be. Um, and you also have a tech-driven market, right? So a lot of the sectors here, you know, and I'd highlight most notably, um, you know, REITs, um, uh, utilities, um, even things like cell towers and things like that, um, you know, they've been, they've been used as a source of funds, right? Um, the, 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 the securities that these securities also tend to be higher yielding. Um, mm -hmm. And that income is much less important when you have you know, short-term rates at 5%, right? If someone can put money in the um, in the money market and be earning 4 or 5% right now, that utility dividend um, at 3 or 4% isn't nearly as, as appealing as it usually is. So um, the defense uh, that these, uh, that some of these sectors often also will usually provide, people aren't playing any defense. They don't care about defense right now because the market just keeps going up and up. So um, I think that's made for a tough time um, in, in real assets, you know, I, I talk about utilities, um, you know, utilities underperformed the S and P 500 by 34% last year on a relative basis, right? They've underperformed by another 9% so far this year. Um, you know, their, their relative PEs are at 20 year lows, right? So, um, you know, these stocks have gotten very beaten up, but there's no one sort of wanting to come in and, and, and move in on them. So even though, we think that there's a lot of value there. We think these companies are performing generally pretty well. They're going to continue to have pretty steady growth. Um, they are even benefiting from some of the higher economic um, activity that we're seeing and certainly some of the um, activity um, around that's happening around tech and AI. Uh, there will be some benefits for utilities. Um, you know, right now, people are, are really ignoring that. So, um, you know, as investors, we obviously go in cycles, and I think with real assets, um, we think there's value there. I don't think we think that there's a, a near-term catalyst, that these things are suddenly necessarily going to accelerate, but there will be a turn in the market, and at that point, um, you know, we think the stocks are going to play very well. And so, you know, our message to all investors is diversification is important, right? Markets can really run, and you can really benefit from that, but you got to make sure that when it turns that you're not caught, um, you know, flat-footed. You know, I'm glad you brought up that diversification word. All right. We talk a lot about it here at Zephyr and creating optimized portfolios. And yes, maybe real assets and utilities, they've underperformed, but they play a role in that portfolio that you can't really get rid of and you don't want to get rid of, right? You want that defense um, because markets move quicker now than ever, right? And, and we've talked a lot about betting on interest rates and interest rate moves is probably not a good idea right so you know if interest rates fall i'm assuming interest rates fall that's going to be probably good for utilities those higher dividend higher yielding yeah. real assets I, I think that's exactly right i mean if you look at the fourth quarter um when we did think that rates were going to come down and the fed was going to start cutting right um you know REITs were the top performing sector in the s p 500 in the fourth quarter utilities had a good fourth quarter as well. So um, I think you've got to, we do want to see those interest rates start to drop. And when they do drop, I think these sectors will start working. Again, I think the reason you've seen them struggle again in the first quarter is that we thought we were on this downward trajectory. 
Um, and then that sort of got interrupted. Well, maybe the, the economy's stronger and the Fed's not going to have to cut as much. They still have to worry a little bit about inflation. So, you know, rates, 10-year especially, has is, is gone back up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that scared people away. And again, they're, they're um, you know, using it as a source of funds instead of uh, investing into it. Yeah. And, you know, recently, yes, the Magnificent Seven and those mega cap tech stocks are still driving markets, but it seems like there's a little bit more breadth and markets and equities now. So maybe that will help out real assets moving forward. So you mentioned oil. Um, yeah. Oil, I, I, I always get leery of oil just because it's so sensitive to geopolitics. And, and we know the risks that are associated, associated with geopolitics, especially now, um, maybe more so than ever. Are there other ways to gain exposure to oil or energy that may reduce the sensitive sensitivity to geopolitics? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, oil has been also very fascinating. We spend a lot of time certainly um, looking at it, both from the overall macro perspective, because it is, can't have a lot of influence on the consumer, um, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, but, but certainly as we look at our investments within energy infrastructure and in energy more broadly, you know, oil is obviously a key component of that. So we spend a lot of time, um, thinking about it and talking to people about it and trying to analyze it. And, um, you know, oil has been pretty, was pretty volatile last year. Um, we saw a big run on oil, um, as when, with the attacks on Israel, um, and, it, you know, close the third quarter at, a, at, you know, up a decent amount, and then it gave it all back in the, in the fourth quarter, right? The geopolitics really haven't been, um, as, uh, haven't gotten priced in as maybe as much as you thought they would. Okay. And, and you do have a situation where, you know, supply and demand are fairly balanced and, and that's really being driven um, by OPEC and the Saudis. We were doing a very good job, um, you know, balancing the market out. Um, always a risk that they step away, uh, in which case we'll see oil fall a lot. And we certainly experienced that. But um, it, it's hard unless you're a big believer that geopolitics is going to get a lot worse um, to be feeling like, you know, oil is going to rip much higher. Um, uh, I think we sort of, it, you know, it's traded, it's interesting, it's traded in a $10 range uh, for the last 80 plus days. You don't usually see that in oil. Um, uh, I think our gut is that it's, or our instinct is that it's probably um, more comfortable going lower than higher. But as you said, it's all about geopolitics, right? So mm -hmm. if you're trying to get around that geopolitics, where do we think the opportunities are? Um, you know, traditional energy investment is into, uh, e and and oil service stocks, right? And, um, you know, I think those companies are being relatively uh, well run, but I think those stocks are going to be, the prices are going to get dictated about what oil does. Um, and, you know, to a lesser extent, natural gas. But um, uh, so if you're not a, a, a rabbit, a big bull on oil right here, you know, it, it, it's hard to really want to jump in. So where do you play around that? Um, you know, midstream energy has been really good. Okay. Um, it's had three really good years of returns. You know, this midstream energy was a dirty, midstream energy and MLPs was a dirty word for investors from, <laughs> you know, 2014, 2020. Um, they lost an unbelievable amount of money um, as you sort of saw the unwind of the whole MLP uh, bubble, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so people are still very wary about it. Um, I think there's a lot less investment. There are a lot less funds uh, invested there. Uh, but again, if you look at the returns over the last three years, They've actually been quite good, um, even right. versus the broader market. And I think what happened is, you know, that bubble burst and the management teams finally figured it out. Uh, you saw a lot of consolidation. Um, the story became about free cash flow and not about just growth. Um, you know, whereas previously, this was growth at all costs. So you're seeing a lot of free cash flow get generated. You're still seeing very attractive dividends uh, getting paid. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing a lot of companies doing buybacks. Um, and these things are still at very reasonable valuations. I mean, MLPs, uh, midstream companies trade at sort of nine times, eight, nine times forward EBITDA. Um, you know, it's pretty attractive, especially versus the broader market. Um, so we still think that that's a good defensive way um, to play energy. And they're just not, uh, you know, they're more they're more sensitive to volumes than they are to absolute okay. price. Um, so if you think we're going to continue to have, um, you know, fairly consistent volumes, which from a production point of view, um, I think most people would say is is highly likely. Um, you can feel I think pretty good about these stocks. Um, you know, I think the other area that we've um, nibbled in and had some really nice success is the refiners. Okay. Um, now these tend to be 
pretty commodity sensitive, yeah. but I wouldn't say they're oil sensitive, right? Um, they tend to be more sort of uh, spread sensitive. Um, but what you see in the refining world right now is that there's um, the big refiners are still very, very advantaged. Um, we're short refining capacity, um, not new refining capacity is, is not getting added very quickly. There's some new refining capacity coming on worldwide, but very little in the U S mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what you're seeing the opposite, you're seeing refiners continue to close because environmentally yeah. um, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues around them. So, um, but I think you, you have just a very big advantage on these refiners. Um, they're putting up very good, consistent earnings. Um, they're sort of valued at mid-cycle, but their earnings have been much better than mid-cycle. Um, but they're just generating massive amounts of cash flow. Um, you know, Marathon Petroleum has bought back $28 billion of stock uh, since the pandemic, right? That's like half their market cap. Wow. Um, you know, Valero, another name we, we really like is, is a name that's, um, you know, buying back a ton of stock and putting cash to work. And so, you know, we think those names, they're still fairly cheap. Um, they've always traded cheap because they're viewed as being very commodity sensitive. Um, but we actually think that they're a very interesting place to be. And we think the summer um, is setting up is is probably a really good um, window for them because we're not, we're still very short summer gasoline. You have the switch from winter to summer gasoline. Um, there's really been no incentive to uh, store gas summer gasoline, um, and so we think we could see some big moves on those in the in the in the summer. Awesome, uh, a lot of insight there on oil. I love it. Um, so when you know we talked about MLPs, MLPs now they're a lot easier to gain access to for just a retail investor, right? Through ETFs and um, other just mainstream investments. It, do you just is that a piece where you just kind of put in your alternative sleeve? You think in a portfolio? Yeah, I think we see most people doing it in an alternative sleeve, right? And there okay. are certainly uh, mutual funds and and still closed end funds out there that trade in them. I think from a, um, you know, it, it shrunk down a lot. I think when we, you know, 10 years ago, there were probably 125, 150 uh, midstream and MLPs, right? Now, I think the number is probably more like 50. Wow. And I would tell you that maybe 30 of them are really investable. So mm -hmm. it's really shrunk down as an asset class. So I think what we're seeing is a lot more people investing in ML, at least fund managers mm -hmm. investing in, ML, in MLPs as a subset of a broader portfolio. So we certainly see them in, in infrastructure when we talk about global listed infrastructure. That's one of the sleeves that's in there. I think you see some utility funds um, having some mixture of, of MLPs in there. So, um, but there are still standalone funds out there. We still have a standalone fund. Mm -hmm. um, it's performed very well, um, but uh, it's getting harder and harder because the universe just sort of continues to shrink. Interesting. You know, you brought up real estate and REITs. Uh, it's been a very interesting past couple of years for real estate. And right now, when you think of real estate, you think of in REITs, you think commercial real estate and office buildings, you're like, no, stay away, right? Because of all the issues there. But REITs, like Utah, is more than just office space. What are some REIT subsectors that you like and, and maybe why? Yeah, so right, I think you made a, a really good point. When people think about real estate, they think about traditional real estate. So they think about office, they think about regional malls, uh, they think mm -hmm. about apartments, maybe industrial, uh, maybe lodging, but you don't get much before, much beyond that, right? Um, whereas, you know, the REIT sector today is actually made up of 16 different subsectors, wow. right? And a lot of the, a, a lot of the growth and even a lot of the indexes, if you go look at them, um, uh, are made up much more of these new growthier um, subsectors than they are of sort of the traditional ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, office gets all the headlines. Um, office is a tough subsector right now, right? We all know what's going on with work from home. We all know what's going on in the big cities, uh, the vacancy rates, um, mm -hmm. buildings being given back to lenders, um, right? Office is very tough, but, you know, office in the, in the uh, index right now is like four or 5%, right? It's a, it, uh, it's a very small number. Whereas if you look at some of these newer sectors that we would talk about, so what would be that? You know, the, the hottest sector is obviously data centers. Um, we all know what's going on with AI, right? AI requires a lot of um, computing power. It requires a lot of data. It requires a lot of, uh, you know, centers to be able to run through um, cloud computing as, as well. So um, you've seen massive growth in the data centers. Um, so that's certainly a very hot area. And while it's run a lot, um, it's hard to argue with sort of the growth story that's around 
um, data centers and just going to the future, the additional need uh, for capacity that we're going to need as AI continues to grow. Um, you know, healthcare, we think there's some really interesting stuff with healthcare. Um, healthcare stocks, so, you know, these, these could be, um, you know, senior living type facilities or retirement communities. These things got absolutely killed during the pandemic, right? Why? Well, two big reasons. One, employment was a huge problem. And secondly, more importantly, right? You know, when the pandemic was going on, there was a lot of negative stories about uh, people getting trapped in, in retirement homes and nursing homes. Yeah. A lot of people pulling pulling um, themselves or pulling parents or loved ones out of those, right? And so the industry really fell on it, you know, got, got hit really badly. Um, that's really reversed. I think as time has gone by, you know, the value of senior living, um, the importance of, of retirement homes, of, of, of taking care of, of people um, is still very much um, in people's minds. And um, so you're starting to see people come back in. And then the, the employment issue you had, which was it was very hard to find a staff, um, that's obviously labor has gotten a lot um, uh, more equalized and, um, you know, there's a lot more supply. And so that's really gone away. So, you know, once again, these um, uh, senior living facilities are really doing well. Um, and we think that's going to continue. So that's another area. Um, I think single family homes, that's another area that we okay. still like a lot. Um, you know, with mortgages so high, uh, it's hard to buy. Um, you know, the single family home rental market um, is very attractive. Uh, so that's another area that, um, you know, we, we think has a lot of promise. Interesting. You know, you brought up water um, earlier as a subsector of real assets. Living out on the West Coast, uh, you know, on the shores of an Alpine Lake, water is very popular, yet highly contested topic. And as I speak, we're in the midst of a huge storm that's going to dump about 12 feet of snow on us. Right. And that's after 50 feet of snow last year. So um, water is not a problem right now. But can you tell us a little bit more about your water strategy? Sure. So, um, you know, I think water is is really fascinating. This is a um, uh, a strategy that we took over a couple of years ago and um, just really excited about it. And, you know, it all revolves around this global water crisis we face, which basically comes down to the fact, you know, that, that supply is going to exceed. I mean, de demand is going to exceed supply by there's going to be a 40 percent gap um, between supply and demand by 2030. Right. And so and this is a problem. Yes, I, I think we all can think of, you know, um, under-resourced, uh, lesser developing countries where water is a big problem, where you, mm -hmm. you know, 80% of the waves water is untreated. But this is a problem everywhere, right? It's a problem with in, in the U.S. with infrastructure. It's a problem um, where we have droughts. Um, it's a problem where we have floods, right? Um, and climate change is absolutely exacerbating the problem even more. So what this strategy is is designed to do is invest in companies uh, that are looking to solve uh, this water crisis. And so um, we break it down into focusing on companies um, that are investing in, in water supply, uh, water quality, uh, and water efficiency. And this can be anything from you know, utilities, big water utilities, to um, industrial companies, to you know, life sciences companies that are doing a lot of water testing and that type of thing, um, to engineering and, con and construction firms, which are doing a, a lot of work in terms of, um, you know, uh, putting in a lot of this new infrastructure that needs to go in. Um, uh, there's just a lot going on in the sector. And this is just, you know, when you look at the secular growth story around water, um, it's extremely attractive. Uh, if you look at the, the water index or the water stocks, you know, they've, they've handily outperformed uh, the big indexes, you know, the S&P or the ACWI over the last 15 years. Um, it's just a very consistent secular growth story that we absolutely think is going to continue. Um, so uh, we're very excited about it. Interesting. I'm definitely going to have to look into that more. Um, real quickly, I do want to touch on clean energy. You brought it up earlier in the real struggles clean energy had in 2023, which kind of surprised me when you have a Democrat, you know, a, a Democrat in office and, and President Biden, you think clean energy, you know, when he was going to be the asset class, right, for for his um you know, stay in the White House, right. but that really hasn't been the case. What contributed to the struggles? And do you think it's going to be another tough year with this contentious uh, presidential election this year? Sure. Um, yeah, it's 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 been a interesting, but also a frustrating space to invest in. Um, we certainly have a situation where you had a big run up 
uh, in these stocks as 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 the Biden as Biden won and took over. Um, and I think what's happened is, you know, we're still in very early stages of this energy transition. Um, you know, I think the the exciting part about this story is that this is going to be a 20, 30, 40 year uh, type um, investment uh, uh, program. And um, we really do think you're going to continue to see change. I think when people poured into it, they were thinking, well, this is going to be, you know, we're going to start realizing this and the profits are going to soar, you know, in a couple of years. And, and from the beginning, I think we understood that this is was going to be a very long time frame. But I think that the higher interest rates um, have certainly pressured a lot of these companies. You know, these are small growth companies, right? And while uh, big cap tech, big cap tech has obviously performed very well, um, you know, small cap tech, non-earning uh, companies uh, have struggled. So, 